What's up, everybody? Kevin Wagstaff, one of the owners and founders of Spectora. Another episode of Spectora Spotlight with Bobby Ortiz. Um, he is a firefighter that has been doing inspections basically full time along with doing his full time job. And I know a lot of new inspectors or soon to be inspectors are in that situation. So I love that we have another guest on that talks about the real life balance and juggle of being a family man, working a job, ramping up the home inspections, and then thinking about what's going to be next and how you're going to um, manage that as the business grows and also some of the hard times and challenges and, and things that he's done well and things that uh, he could do better. So great insight. Um, and so this is something I think a lot of you can benefit from. Um, and again, share the podcast, share the episode, you guys, this is what helps us keep doing it. Um, and I know there's lots of first year inspectors that whether you have a full-time job or not, if inspections is your full-time job, um, this could be extremely valuable advice. And, uh, and it's just nice to hear other people's perspective and how they think about things. So if you guys have ideas for guests, definitely let us know. Um, let us know on Instagram, follow us and let us know on that account there. And, um, and Lorna will make it happen. Hope you enjoy. Thanks. Funny. Nice mic. I like this. I appreciate it, man. That's awesome. So that the intent is for us at some point for me and uh, some other guys that are farming that do things off duty is to create a podcast also. So, I know. I um, love that. I love that you mentioned that. Tell me more about that. Let's just jump in and start, start hearing about kind of what, what prompted that kind of what made you think about it. Yeah, so initially before like the whole, I guess, Angie's list type stuff, um, was big, I created a website and it was called off duty pro. And the whole premise behind that was to get other firefighters or police officers, paramedics that have a business on the side. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a place for people to be able to go to where these people were already trusted, already background checked. We're in people's houses every day. Anyways, mm -hmm. it was just an opportunity for people to be able to visit this. Uh, but it was way before any of that and trying to get people to actually buy into it was kind of a big thing so it's like 10 or 12 years ago probably ahead of its time so yeah so it just it never it never worked itself out so i kind of gave up on that whole little thought process of it uh and my wife is in real estate her mom is in real estate uh and this is our eighth home uh, that we've purchased in 16 years of being married so <laughs> wow every two years every two years. Man, it's it's been, it's been a wild ride, but this is, I guess, the one that we're going to stay in now. Uh, she works from home. She's a transaction coordinator. Mm -hmm. So she works from home most of the time. So I'm in our, our spare bedroom and not the office because she's right. in there with her multiple monitors and <laughs> working diligently. Right on. Um, so yeah, let's, I want to hear, you know, I'm sure everyone listening wants to hear kind of your background and journey here. Um, and kind of, like you said, your connection with service providers, um, first responders, and kind of like, I know it's near and dear to your heart, but yeah. How did you get here to where you're at today? Man, so I've been a fireman for 20 years. Just Thank about. you for that, by the way. Man, of course, it's a it's an awesome job. That's what it is. I, you know, there's a lot of reference to heroism and, and that's not what we are at all, man. We, we serve a purpose just like everybody else. We play our part in the market. Um, so it's fun. We get to see and do a lot of cool things. We're involved with stuff that's never the same. So there's a lot of good times to that. Uh, but to bring me more forward, uh, I started in the HVAC industry with, with my father-in-law. Where at? Uh, here in the Austin, Texas area. Okay. Yep. Uh, I moved from California in 98 and then just rel relocated to here. Uh, and then that's where I met my wife. She, she went to uh, Texas. I graduated from A&M. So it's, uh, we're kind of a house divided here. I don't know. If, <laughs> in Colorado, you guys understand the... Uh, the, the whole multitude of that, but it's a big deal down here. So you migrated so, to Texas way before it was cool, way but like 20 yeah. <laughs> years before everyone else in California decided to go to Austin. Man, I did. <laughs> and then everybody in my whole family followed me. And then I think everybody else from California has followed me since. They're still coming. Yeah. yeah. I was just driving back from an inspection right now. And I promise you, I saw 20 license plates. I said California on them and I just was <laughs> shaking my head the whole time. And the prices here are going unbelievable. I think it's just getting started too, if this migration continues. Yeah. So uh, my wife started in real estate when uh, we started having children about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. She was uh, an agent and she didn't like the whole thought process of cold calling people to try and create business. And she's a dot every I, cross every T type of person. She, she can handle a billion different things at a time. 
and she became a transaction coordinator for a team of two uh, about 10 years ago and then just migrated, got picked up on, on actually on LinkedIn from a, a larger worldwide company. And she's, she's a transaction coordinator for them now and she's loving it. Um, but after about our third or fourth purchase of a home, I was like, man, I, there's just no connection between a home, home inspector and the home buyer. You know, people that are generally are in this trade are very dry personalities. Uh, it's this or that. Um, and I just thought, you know what, this is a good opportunity for me. Somebody who already has to deal bad news to people on a regular basis as my position in the fire service when we're medical calls that people who don't survive and I'm having to speak to the family members, I deal bad news constantly. So right. there's kind of an art in dealing bad news. Uh, so it kind of translates, you know, into having deal poor news to a client with, with the home inspector stuff. Uh, and I've had a blast. I've been doing it now for just about a year and this has been a wild ride. So that's amazing. Yeah. And I agree with you that what a special skill to be able to deliver news, the, the art of it. Um, what, like what initially, what was that moment when you were just like, huh, home inspections? Like it was it after one of those houses when you were just like, man, I could see myself doing that better. Or like, what was that moment that made you want to get into it? Yeah. So we, like I said, it was our third or fourth house to, uh, to purchase, uh, and just dealing with the home inspector and seeing the things that he saw. And I would always do kind of my pre when I would go into a house to see if, Hey, this is something that we want. Is this a house that we're going to flip and move? Um, but I would always trust the professional to come in somebody that was trained and schooled in the, Hey, what are you actually looking for? Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, probably, I guess about two years ago, my wife and I started talking about, like, this is something that you should really dive into. You'd be really good at this. So I started looking into it and I went and I got online and started looking at different schools. And I didn't even learn about, uh, InterNACHI until I was already uh, involved in another school. Uh, but have since become an InterNACHI member. There's a lot of good info on there. Yeah. Uh, but I went through a hit and that was a great school. We had the all online um, class and then we came, they came to Austin and taught some, some portions of it in person, but that was right before COVID. So I'm curious on the real estate. So did you guys flip houses or was it just more of trade up every couple of years? Cause that's the smart thing to do. And so, Yeah. Uh, a lot of my buddies have, have laughed at us like, oh my God, it must be time for you to move again. You got to change the air filters in your house. Yeah. Uh, but we've always traded up, you know, and I've, I've paid a lot of attention to the bigger pockets kind of stuff, you know, the burst strategies and with investing. So we've done the investing, we've done uh, the move up strategies uh, and we have flipped. There was a couple of those homes that we got for really good deals, you know, with my wife and her in real estate, my mother-in-law and the MLS we get to see just as you were a realtor, I can see when stuff is a good deal. Yeah. Uh, and when it's time just to take advantage of those things. So kind of with the, with that in our pocket, we made some very smart decisions and to get us where we are today. And it's been awesome. Beautiful. I'm sure. I wonder if, is it even harder for you now because it's such a rising market or is it, is it tougher because you feel like so, you're, you're buying at these nosebleed prices? Yeah, that's impossible right now. Uh, I was just actually talking to the agent that I just did this inspection for this morning. Uh, he and I are friends and we were talking and it's, it's impossible. You know, he has a house or a condo in downtown Austin, like on the 60th floor of one of the buildings. And he's just holding on to it right now because he can't reinvest that money into something right now that we think might be a good deal. And it's the yeah. same thing for us. The, yeah. the amount of equity I have in my home right now is impressive, but where do you go? Yeah. You know, I live somewhere further out. Yeah. And I have, you know, children, I have a, a 14 year old boy and a 12 year old boy. They both play baseball. One of them's in high school. His game is this afternoon. Nice. So, yeah. And you can't pick up and move 30 miles outside the city and turn everyone's life upside down just to get a oh, yeah. better deal. Uh, they would hate me if I did that to them Yeah, <laughs> at this point in their lives. Yeah, for sure. Austin's similar to Denver where it's just like, I tell people, I'm like, Oh yeah. Rule of thumb here is like never sell real estate. There's no reason to, to sell because it's rapidly increasing. And you got to jump mm -hmm. on um, another rising ship quickly. It's impressive. Uh, Colorado's impressive. My friend is a, a realtor there in Aspen. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a golf pro. We grew up together in, in California. No kidding. And he ended up being a golf pro out there. Uh, I, I think it's called the Roaring Fork is the name of a, yeah. uh, a country club out there. 
Yeah. And so now he starts, he started doing real estate and he sent me a, a photo of one of the houses that he listed. It was like six and a half million dollars for a 2,500 square foot house. I was yeah. blown away. Those are the shacks out there. That, that's probably yeah. where the low, low income people. <laughs> that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the so, bad oh, neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, that was crazy. Well, I want to hear about kind of the, like splitting the time making the decision and kind of like shifting the schedule. I know like when you said the podcast, you guys are going to get into a lot of that type of stuff of like Mm -hmm. how to balance that type of life with being a firefighter. So like, how did you approach that from the beginning? How'd you think about it? So there's a lot of opportunity for us as firefighters to have a second career. We work Mm -hmm. 10 days a month. So, and that's a full-time position on 24 Mm -hmm. off 48 in most cases. In some areas of the of the world, they're 48, 96, and so you're on two days off, four days. Okay. Um, but that's in either case, where you still have plenty of time to to recoup your body, uh, get plenty of rest, and then fire off on something else if you want to. Uh, and with my kids of age, my wife, you know, not having to tend to them and and me uh, having to split that that time it was just a good opportunity at 20 years in 10 years before about retirement from the fire service to start something that I can continue. That's not going to be a, a body breaker, but I can, over the next 10 years, I can create a business and, and create, you know, relationships with agents and just build this to where people have a lot of trust uh, in me and the product that, that I put out there. And Spectora has done a huge a huge part uh, in playing that role of, hey, this is this is an amazing product. What do you think? You know, this is this is a story that the house told me. I jotted it down on this program, uh, and it's been great. But your team is awesome, by the way. Uh, oh, with, thanks, man. Man, all the people that are on uh, the self help. I know Lou is on there a lot, uh, and I communicate with her, and she always has like the instant answer up here. This is how you fix it. Uh, I kind of feel, <laughs> it kind of feels silly sometimes because it's right in front of your face. If you, yeah. you know, just pay attention, but yeah, they're awesome. So you've created something uh, there that, that provides a service to us. Uh, and I only feel um, like I have to put it out there. Like, Hey, this isn't just me. This is like a, this is a whole team effort. Uh, and you guys have, have played a huge part into that. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll definitely pass it along. Lulu will get a kick out of that. She's a sweetheart. And we, yeah, we just hired three more people because we want to always be answering quickly, efficiently, mm-hmm. and have good people in the right places. And we know that gets you guys onto your jobs quicker and more efficient and everyone wins. You know, one of the things that helps me out a lot, especially for being able to do like multiple inspections in a day is I'm done with the inspection report when I'm done with the inspection. You know, with, with the it's less I have to upload the pictures from my thermal imaging camera right. or upload the pictures from a drone. If I can't get on the roof, uh, then I, you know, I'll fly my drone. And so minus those two things of uploading photos, the inspection is done. You know, I was able to create the template over the first several months of doing this so that it's, it's seamless at this point. And I just have a pick from, you know, basically everything that I could possibly think of uh, as far as a deficiency. And it's in there and I just, I just cruise, I just cruise through it. Beautiful. So it's super helpful. Yeah. Beautiful. So you, do you just, do you have specific days you work or does it rotate and then you have to block off your schedule as soon as you get your firefighting schedule? So that's probably like the, the biggest difficulty, I guess, is my schedule and mm-hmm. the way that the software does the schedule. So I have to stay on top of that because I work every third day. Oh, uh, so yeah, I see what you're saying. We've thought about baking in some rules like that to where it's like, a hybrid of open scheduling versus time slots. Yeah. So I just have to make sure that, cause I just do it by the week, by every seven days or however that one is set up. Mm-hmm. So every few days I'll just go in there and open up the Monday, Tuesday, close Wednesday, open and Thursday, Friday for slots. Uh, generally speaking though, I have, you know, 10 or 12 agents that I work for consistently that are keeping me very busy. So they'll just call me on the phone. Hey, do you have time available? And especially right now in this market, I feel like I'm taking reservations yeah. because, you know, there's 60 offers, a hundred offers on a home. So I'll have an agent saying, Hey, we're going to make an offer on the house. If we get it, can you do it within the next three days? Cause that's going to be our option period is three days. So can I just like put my name on a slot and, you know, potentially have a, have a spot. 
So, and I do that a lot for the realtors that I do a lot of work for. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, we're a team and I've, I tell them that all the time without them, there is no me. And, you know, without us together, you know, then the client loses. But if we all work together to make sure that, you know, we get everything done, then the client wins every time. Yeah. And that just gives, I mean, that I'm like already brainstorming kind of feature ideas and ways we can make the scheduler um, to account for this new dynamic of, Hey, don't know if we're going to get accepted, but if we do, we need to lock this in with like a text message or, you know, and so mm -hmm. that could be tough. Cause yeah, if you have like 10 of those. So the thing know. that I've been doing is I just, I, I close it out with when I disable the, uh, the alerts. Oh, disable notifications. Yeah. Put throw it the in notifications. there. No notifications. Yeah. So all the info is in there and I obtain all the info for all parties and I disable the notifications. And then, um, after that, I just confirm it once they say, Hey, we do have the house. So tomorrow, eight o'clock in the morning. So I've, some houses I've had to be very flexible. Some of them have 60 offers. Oh God. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So I just did a home. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with central Texas, the Kyle Buda area, which is South of Austin. And okay. it used to be super rural. Mm -hmm. um, this house was a 2015 home purchased initially for about 110,000. Uh, and this house went for 360,000 listed at 309 one day on the market. Uh, it's unbelievable. So if you don't have 60 to a hundred thousand dollars to be able to put down because they're not even, they're not even doing contingencies based on uh, appraisal. Right. They're so way, you have to waive the appraisal, yeah. but everything. It's unbelievable. So yeah, like I said, I feel like I take reservations more than where as it was, you know, four or five months ago, I was able to schedule seven to 10 days out. And I knew what my, my next two weeks were going to look like allegedly, or now it's, it's not, it's, Hey, so right now I have nothing scheduled and tomorrow I'm going to have two, the next day I'm going to have two or three and you only know the day of, and then for the next three days. Wow. So it's creating almost more upfront work and coordination for you guys. And then obviously a less like a breakneck pace when it happens, but you're getting like maybe five, 10 X, the number of realtors saying, okay, we think we might need you. That's yeah, difficult. And it's I super can... difficult for them. You know, I feel so bad for the buyer agents because they're, that's all they do now is they show houses and show houses and show houses and write multiple offers in a day and just hopes that one of them catches, you know? So I, I feel obligated to be like, absolutely. I will work around whatever it takes <laughs> to make this happen because I feel your pain. I see the, you know, the look on your face when you're just wore down, you know? Yeah. The seller agents, I mean, shoot, they're easy street. They're man. A, yeah, absolutely, man. They list it and it's sold. You know, they don't have to worry about contingencies. They don't have to worry about anything uh, except for, you know, finding a house to actually sell because if somebody's trying to stay local, unless they have already, you know, bought another home and are building, they're just not going to find anything to move into. You tapped into something I want to ask you about a minute, or you, you mentioned something I want to see where it comes from within you of just saying, just that you casually said that mentality of, yeah, do whatever it takes. We're going to work with you. Like not everyone has that. And I think that's a common thread of people that are successful in the first year. And that's kind of like life advice that I've read and heard from mentors is like, say yes to everything when you're early in, in a business or a career, and it's going to feel like you're stretched. It's going to feel like mm -hmm. you don't want to, everyone is like, oh, I don't want to condition them to thinking so. It's like, worry about that later when you actually have the business to worry about. Where does that, like, where did that mentality come from? Or was it just natural to you to just say like, well, yeah, I'm going to do everything I can to get like these relationships. Well, so I want to build this. I want to build this to be successful. I want it to be known around, you know, the Austin metro area that, hey, this guy is super trustworthy. He gets stuff done. He does what he says that he's going to do. Um, to be flexible, but being as a fireman for the last 20 years, I'm a captain on a ladder truck. So uh, I lead a group of guys uh, and without the teamwork that gets involved, we wouldn't accomplish anything from a cardiac arrest to a structure fire to a vehicle rescue. It's not me on the front lines that, that gets the, the task, you know, accomplished and that, that saves the life of the patient or that saves the home, you know, of the individual or the family. It's a collective effort. So if we don't have that mindset of, hey, everybody keeps working until the job gets done, then the job will never get done or one of us will get hurt. So that's just kind of 
I guess it's ingrained in me after 20 years of doing that. You just, you do what you have to do in order to get the job accomplished. And love that, you know, just, absolutely just love that. I think everyone can learn something from that. So any new inspectors or soon to be inspectors that are listening, I think, I think you can train yourself to have that team mentality and approach. I think people that come from other walks of life or businesses where they had to be on a team, you can feel that when you talk to an agent, you know, and an agent can feel that when you're, when someone really feels like they're on the same side of the booth with you as a team versus a vendor or just a contract, you know, like there's just a yeah. very different energy that you feel. And I think inspectors need to really embody that and treat agents as like, Hey, we are on a team and we have a common goal or we have aligned goals. Well, sometimes misaligned, I guess, depending on the agent, but you each want to serve the customer and do what's best. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it is, it is a team, it's a team sport. Yeah. You know, like I was telling you a minute ago, both my boys play, you know, baseball, they play at a very competitive level select. It's 365 days a year. Uh, it's the same thing that we're teaching them. Hey, you yeah. might not always get that spot that you want to play, or you might not be in the best position, but you got to make sure that whatever position that coach puts you in, that you know how to play that position, where, where that next play goes so that you don't fumble the ball and, you know, cause the issue for the team that you're always ready playing heads up. And it's the same thing in life. It's the same thing in every career, no matter what the job is, you have to be willing to do what it takes to get the job done. Gosh, that, and that it, we we're probably still underestimating the value of that and what agents feel um, as opposed to the ones that look at agents as kind of like the adversary, the other side, you know, the other part of the deal or, just whatever negative feelings people have towards or inspectors mm -hmm. have towards agents. Um, I think people can do a lot for themselves if they discard that and just say, Hey, they're doing what they believe is right. They're trying to do a good job. Yeah. And it's so funny that, that you say that. And I read that I read a lot of posts on the, on the Nachi website and you know, <laughs> different forums, but I never contribute. I, I just, I don't like to get my name in the mix of, you know, opinions one way or the other on stuff like that. But I do see that, you know, the riff that is allegedly there between agents and inspectors, but I've never, I've never had that. Not even with agents that, you know, that were the listing agents. I've never had any, anybody that's any sort of altercation where you did this or you did that, or you missed this, or you, I haven't had that. Everybody has always just been very welcoming and appreciative. And I know that there are going to be times where I'm going to, you know, face some adversity in that but yet do you have done that at all it's been great i i think there's a common thread there and it's probably you and i like to think i always say inspectors that are always pointing the finger you're like okay what's the common thread between all these situations that went south it's probably you at the end of the day so like the forums <laughs> forums drive me nuts i i can speak about it because i've been in there for years and have you know read pretty much everything there's to read and uh yeah well, the people that ignore it end up being better off and their energy and vibe mm -hmm. is way better at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Cause I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about doing this. You know, it, it's been a short order, but I've been, you know, in the construction industry, I've been doing inspections for the better part of 20 years, commercial, like on the fire side and fire safety, uh, and those types of things. So I've been, you know, as far as on the fire side is concerned, uh, I'm a master inspector. Uh, it's it's different and it's the same in a lot of aspects we do a lot of commercial stuff like right now uh, amazon is building one of their monstrosities there in the town that i that i work in i serve uh, and it's five million square feet it's huge <laughs> so it takes a, it takes a lot of hands to go in there and do building and fire inspections on on stuff like that so some of the things are similar obviously there's there's differences um but I've been doing inspections a long time on the residential side, you know, a very short order. And, and by no means do I know it all. And I'm not ever going to come across as, Hey, this is the absolute way uh, that it is. And I think that paints a very negative connotation on, on this industry. And then me as an inspector is to, to have an attitude like that. Totally completely agree. Do you use that in your marketing or will you use that um, when interacting with agents of like, it's a great, kind of pitch line to say like, yeah, I'm, I may be starting, I just started doing inspections for residential a year ago, but I've been doing inspections for 20 years. I feel like that's like homepage material there. Yeah. I mean, I don't do very much marketing though. Yeah. I let's talk post about a that. lot of stuff. I post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn, 
but I don't have I don't have a good flavor or taste in my mouth for social media in general. I know it's kind of like this necessary evil, mm-hmm. uh, but kind of like the chat forums, I don't like the the bickering back and forth. And you can't necessarily have a business page without a personal page. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my only advertising, the things that I do is, is on LinkedIn. And then I do a lot of face-to-face. So while COVID, yes, is a real thing. Uh, and Texas, as many of you guys from the outside probably have heard, it's the mask mandate. They wear uh, the masks when still going into places. Like in the restaurants, they'll still say, hey, wear the mask until you sit down but it's at hundred percent occupancy. So you have people <laughs> five feet from you. Right. Uh, so I, I go into realtors offices constantly, you know, I'm away home from another inspection. If there's one in the town, uh, then I'll stop by and I'll just introduce myself and I'll hand out business cards, but it's more just of a face-to-face talk or one of the realtors that I have that follows me on, on the LinkedIn page. I'll just, I'll shoot them a quick message. Hey, I'm going to be in your part of town tomorrow. You mind if I have five minutes of your time? So yeah, no problem. And I'll swing in there and, and do a little FaceTime with them. But that's really the only marketing that I do. I don't, I, I want to start like this YouTube channel because I think that there, there's a lot of value in that of showing what, what's out there. Um, there's a couple of uh, inspectors in the Houston area that do a very good job of, of the online. Um, I guess he's even using TikTok and I don't do that. That's, I feel like that's for my kids, but. Yeah, we're all uh, too old for that. We're all too <laughs> real. But I guess if, if those are the, tri- the type of people and, and the demographic that you're trying to, to get to, to market to, then I guess that you may have to do that at some point. I don't know. I, I would hope that just word of mouth will get me through it. And so far, so good. I guess one of the biggest things that I don't rely on the income from this. You know, I have a, a full-time job that I've been doing for 20 years that this is all kind of just going to be as a retirement fund. So, and, and I guess to pay for some of the kids college. <laughs> right. Right. If they don't get that scholarship. Um, why LinkedIn? What, why, why was, was that just a natural network that you gravitated to, or did you see agents on there? Like why there? So, Yeah like I was telling you previously, my wife was, is in real estate. She had a LinkedIn account. It's more of a, a corporate environment, I think. And while the realtors don't necessarily go on there to look for uh, potential customers, they may or may not. It seemed like a good area to network with other professionals mm-hmm. that are in every industry. So even on the fire side, the, the people that see me uh, in the fire world that are local firefighters, police officers, EMTs, they know that, hey, I know him from, from years of, of doing uh, emergency services. Hey, look at him, he's, he's doing home inspections. I can use him for that. Um, and I've, I've been able to obtain, I guess, about 340 followers on my Off-Duty Pro LinkedIn page, which is cool. And I think that as long as I'm just out there showing, hey, this is what I'm doing, uh, I'm appreciative of every chance that these agents are giving me. Because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for those relationships that we've been able to create uh, through multiple transactions together with the reliability factor on, on both of our ends, then I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't exist. So I'm super appreciative of every single one of the connections that I've been able to make on that LinkedIn account. And for the ones that follow and that comment, it's, it's been awesome. Feedback has been incredible. You know, I think that on, on y'all's website, um, I have like, I don't know, not very many, 15 reviews, but they're all five stars. I was able to get the reviews uh, set up on my Google page. And it's the same thing, you know, for those that leave actual feedback and that leave uh, the stars for whatever that's for, um, man, I appreciate it. Love it. I love that. And LinkedIn, I, I believe is an underrated platform because everyone naturally just says Facebook, Instagram. Um, but I think LinkedIn is underrated in terms of because agents hang out there. They're always conscious of their network and trying to build it. So it's just more impressions. To me, it's a race Mm -hmm. to 10, 20 impressions, whether that's your brand or logo or a comment on their post, things like that. So I love that you're using that primarily. Yeah, that's it. I don't have a Facebook page. I don't have Instagram. I don't have any of that. Yeah. It's funny because I'm I'm similar in the fact that I 
I kind of like shield myself from negativity, whether it be, you know, mm -hmm. inspectors in our industry or certain types of posts, pages, topics. So I don't even, log as soon as I log into Facebook, I make a conscious effort to immediately click on the business page <laughs> that I'm going to. I don't even want to yeah. see the feed or I don't even want to see what's going on on the personal side. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question I for you. I'm more of a glass half full type of person anyways. You yeah. Know? yeah life's Not to have that because life is going to happen the way that it is. And I think that's one of the things of doing what I've done for the past 20 years is you have very little control over what happens in life. So you either just enjoy every single day and embrace it for what it is, or you can be a very miserable person. Our industry has got a few of them. We know that. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask a question that I think a lot of other inspectors think about all the time. What happens when, because you're clearly off to the races, growing a great business. What happens when you start to feel stretched, when the schedule is completely full, agents start leaning on you more, their mm -hmm. whole offices start using you, what then? So I have two guys right now at the fire department and it's been crazy ever since I started this whole thing. I've had a lot of questions. Hey, so what, tell me more about this. How yeah. does that work? I want to get involved. So, yeah. So I have two guys that have started schooling on their own and wow. they're moving forward. And yeah, the question is, Hey, so when I get finished with this, can I start writing out with you? And then what's the potential for me to start working with you? Because there's a lot more to owning a business than, than people think. <laughs> uh, as you are very well aware yeah yeah but the biggest hurdle on the whole thing is just starting so i guess that may have been like the whole apprehension to starting my own business to begin with is that you know possibly being scared and hey what if it doesn't work out but what if you never try it you know so i did i took that step and we moved forward and i had a lot of backing and support from from my wife and it's like hey just do it you know, what's it going to hurt? We already, we don't rely on it. This isn't, you're not changing careers completely. Right. You know, where you're going to try something, you're going to see if it works. And if you like it, then continue to do it. If you don't, then, then don't. And that was kind of my whole feeling about it before, but I hate to fail at things. So, you know, but last year I was like, you know what, let's just do it. So I have these other two guys and they're probably at least halfway through their schooling now. Uh, Texas is actually changing uh, the criteria for home inspectors. I think they cut the the amount of hours in half from when I did it. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So it's a very heavily regulated state. We have to use a, a specific form as um, you're hundred percent aware mm -hmm. of. Uh, but yeah, they're finishing it and, and they want to be employed. So if I can create this off duty pro where it's, you know, central Texas, you know, and I have many friends in the industry also that I didn't know this is what they did that I've met over the years. And I've seen them since I'm like, oh my God, that's your home inspector too. Uh, and there's so much work out there. Like we couldn't take business away from each other if we wanted no. to, I don't think. No, it's still at that point, the cream, the cream rises to the top, the companies that, that are doing well, keep growing. And it really doesn't come at the expense of others, which is a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. And I don't know why, but this isn't it to me. It doesn't seem like a very sought after career. Mm -mm. Like people don't say, I'm going to be a home inspector when I grow up, but I don't think that they see the potential in the business either. It's part that I, I think there's just such little um, kind of media coverage resources out there. Um, you know, every person we interview inspectors like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, home inspections was the thing, or I didn't realize they uh, used yeah. the software. Every, it's just such an under. I mean, it's a fairly new industry, I guess, right? If we look at the history of, of InterNACHI and how long it's even been around, mm -hmm. it's not that tenured of a profession. No, you know, and I watch a lot of y'all's podcasts. I think I've seen every single one that you guys have put right. out uh, recently, you know, the last couple of years that, that Ben with InterNACHI has put out. There's just so much value in there. And if you can watch, you know, take an hour, you know, and I, honestly, I will watch a lot of your stuff when I'm on the treadmill like at work and you're doing these interviews have you know turned a new page in their life and i i just it makes me just get enthused man and when i'm working out or or running or doing whatever we're doing it just it, it energizes me and keeps me going uh, so then i can learn and I, and I always appreciate learning from every single one of you guys it, i just I, t I take it in this has become 
a real big passion for me and I've enjoyed it. Can't tell you how much I appreciate that because I, after doing, you know, this will be episode like 65 or something like that. Um, I guess occasionally I was like, oh, is it going to be, you know, more of the same? But it's like, no, everyone has a different wrinkle to their story and a different mm-hmm. attitude towards things that resonate with maybe a hundred different inspectors that didn't resonate with the guy that was on before you, you know, and mm-hmm. like the way you just talked about taking action. I wanted to like drill on drill in on that because inspectors are notorious for creating problems that don't exist yet or like worrying about, well, what if in three years when I'm doing this and that, and then this happens, I'm like, what about tomorrow, dude? Like, yeah. like, can you get an inspection? Today? Can you get an inspection <laughs> tomorrow first? Can we get there? Uh, so I love your bias towards just do it. Mm-hmm. You can react and be resilient. No, I think that you have to be though. And I, in order to be happy in general and in life, I think that you have to be able to be fluid and, and just take things that come your way, mm-hmm. you know, and just learn to react. You know, I hate bringing things back to the fire service world, but that's what we do. We solve problems. And it may be difficult for like my, my spouse sometimes because when she comes to me with that, she wants to talk about, she's not necessarily looking for an answer, you know, she's just a sounding board. Yeah. You know, but what we do is somebody calls 911, I go to their house and I fix whatever problem there was. You know, for instance, with this ice storm that we just had here in central Texas, in Colorado, getting 18 inches of snow, that's another Thursday. Uh, <laughs> when that happens in Texas, the whole world shuts down. I mean, we lost power at my house for almost over 48 hours. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That forced me to go buy a, a whole home generator for my house. <laughs> so that'll be getting hooked up here next. You know, because when that happens, I'm gone. You know, in the fire world, they say, hey, we're, we're keeping you here. You're going to continue to run calls. You know, in six days, the department that I work for, we have five stations. And we ran, uh, I guess, about 20 calls short of 1,000 in seven days. So about 980 calls in seven days. And it's just going broken sprinkler pipes. And people still are getting injured. People are still, you know, passing away. And we're putting chains on fire trucks and we're just going and solving problems, you know, and you just, that's what you do. You move from one to the next. Uh, so no wonder home point, inspections are a walk in the park. So no wonder you're just like, oh yeah, this isn't life or death here. I can figure this out. To me, it's just, it's so enjoyable. You know, it, honestly, it's quiet. Uh, I'm in there by myself 90% of the time. And I just go and I do my thing for two and a half, three hours, uh, you know get on a roof and enjoy the view for 10 seconds. (laughs) And I'm taking those views, you know, of Lake Travis, you know, if I do a home uh, around the Lake Travis area and you can see the view of this 50 mile long lake, uh, it's gorgeous. So take the time, take that second just to be able to appreciate, you know, where you are, opportunities you've been given and where you're at now. That's the only case for social media is you get to share that other agents get to see it. Other inspectors Mm -hmm. get to see it. That's the only, that's the only good thing or not the only good thing. That's one of the good things uh, Instagram is for is seeing those kind of cool sites and uh, you know, houses. Mm -hmm. Um, I also love that you, you know, purposely or on, you know, not purposely tapped into your network of firefighters because obviously it's taught you so many amazing things to make you such a good operator and business owner. I think a lot of people forget that their network outside of home inspections could be the best possible place to grow your team where you have like-minded people. So even the trades that I use, like I don't do uh, WDI inspections yet, Mm -hmm. but there's another fireman. He's an Austin fireman. He owns a pest control company. Mm -hmm. So I try every single one of the trades that I use or I recommend, I try and use another fireman. And that's where the whole off-duty pro podcast thing is going to come from. It's just interviewing those guys, kind of the same thing that you do, you know, Hey, how did you get started? What made you want to get, you know, um, you know, kind of going a different path from the fire service. How, what makes your company stronger? How are you successful? All those types of things, because I think that we can all learn from these. And it's the same question that people keep asking. So how did you get started in this? What'd you do? And at the end of the day, it's the same thing. You just have to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we can all have grand ideas, but if you don't take that next step to just do it, you'll never know whether it could have been successful or not. I love it. I think you're going to be massively successful with that because it seems like firefighters is kind of like a brotherhood. And so whether you mm-hmm. do well, guys that just do inspections or just firefighters from anywhere that have side gigs, I bet that would be such a cool niche podcast. 
Um, I think it'll be fun. There's a guy that I work with. He's actually one of my firefighters, uh, the lower ranking guys. Uh, and he and his wife have a resiliency podcast. Mm -hmm. So he's super high energy type of guy too. Uh, a lot of inflection in his voice. He just, he's just a good person to be uh, on, I guess, on, on sound with. And even, you know, visually, I think that he's going to bring a lot of value to it. And with that background in resiliency and just being able to bounce back and just take things as they come and just, you know, have that solution and move on or don't have a solution and kind of work your way through it uh, and, and move forward. It's going to be awesome. I think just to have him as a, a sidekick on there. Oh yeah. It's going to, I think it's going to be great and resiliency. It, it, that gets me thinking, okay, can, can that be taught for someone that maybe hasn't been a firefighter for 20 years? I always think of what people can take away if someone sees you and hears you and is like kind of inspired by that. I personally believe they can take little chunks of your philosophy and try to bake it into their life, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, honestly, I think that the people that we should be teaching resiliency from are, are firefighters' wives, like my wife. She's got to be probably the strongest person that I've ever met in my life. She she has to deal with everything. If, if I'm gone for 24 hours at a time and there's an emergency at the house, I can't just leave. It's all on her. Yeah. Yeah. I can't do it. So she has to know how to handle it or we work through it together on the phone and then she handles the rest of it from there. I think those are the people that we should <laughs> right. have her and, and other <laughs> firefighters wives on the podcast. And I said, Hey, how do you do it? How, how can you help out, you know, the 20 year old firefighter who's just starting out and who maybe he's, you know, he has a, uh, a fiance and this is going to be her life. Yeah. How did, how did you deal with it? So yeah, maybe that's a whole other angle to it. Firefighter, firefighting is such a noble profession. Do you, does that come up when you talk to agents right away? Do you, how much do you kind of um, tap into that? Because I think it, it adds so much credibility and kind of prestige as a home. Yeah. And I mean, just right offhand, I mean, that's, that's how I use it as my business name you know, the, yeah. the off duty pro. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to play off that a little bit, but I don't want to totally like, that's who I am yeah, because right. as a younger fireman, you know, that, that was who I was, you know, I am a firefighter, but that's not what I am now. I'm a husband. I'm a father, you know, I'm a friend. You know, the firefighter thing is, is just a job uh, and it's a, it's a way to make income. And yeah, I have an impact on a lot of people's lives on a daily basis. You know, they call us whether I think it's an emergency or not. They just call 911. It's the worst day of their life because right. they're having to call and ask some random stranger for help uh, in a situation that they don't know how to get themselves out of. Because at the fire department, we're a catch all. So we don't just fight fire and we don't just run medical calls. Like I was saying before, we, we're, we're emergency plumbers. We do it all. <laughs> if somebody doesn't know how to fix it, they dial 911 and they don't send anybody else besides the fire department to fix any other problem that somebody calls for. The police officers don't go there. The ambulance doesn't go there. It's the big red fire truck that shows up and solves their problem. It doesn't matter what it is. I think we all forget that. I think most every non-firefighter forgets that very basic fact. It's it, I think the picture painted is like, oh yeah, you guys get real good at ping pong. Um, but it's like you get called out for everything. Yeah. And and I wouldn't, I would tell the truth. When I first started, there was a lot of downtime. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in order to be a master at your craft, regardless of what it is, training is a huge, is a huge aspect of that. So whether you do the home inspection thing and you're taking, you know, your time uh, to do continuing education and learning new and better ways to to perfect your craft, firefighting is the same way. And it's not just firefighting. It's, you know, I have paramedics, so it's a lot of you know dangerous medications that that we carry. Uh, narcotics, all things that can help people, but if not done 100% correctly, you can injure somebody and you can kill somebody. So there's a lot, a lot of liability involved with, with all of that. So we don't, there is no more ping pong. There is no more video games. And I'm sure at some parts around the nation, it still is that way. Right. But where we are, we're running almost 50 calls a day with five companies. So that's, you know, at least 10 calls per truck a day. And, you know, you figure on a regular medical call, that's uh, at a minimum of an hour uh, for the call. So we stay super, super busy and then training on top of that and keeping up, you know, with everything else we need to do. You said stay something pretty, you said something pretty profound that I want to, uh, whether you meant to or not a minute ago, I think when inspectors over or anyone really over identifies with what they do, I think that leads to 
over emotional reactions. It leads to people getting outside themselves, maybe doing things they normally wouldn't. So I challenge everyone listening. And even this is like all, you know, we all could take this advice as humans is when you think about all the other things in your life that you do and who you are, it kind of takes the edge off of kind of the day to day. And it lets Mm -hmm. you just kind of be natural and kind of flow through it as opposed to if you just, you're all in on being the best damn home inspector and finding every little defect and no agent's ever going to blah, 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 you know, then you just turn into this ball of like (laughs) ball of hate or dysfunction. So I I thought it was really well said the way you just said that of not over identifying with what you do, making it who you are. Well, to me, I think that the most important things to define you are the things that truly matter in your life. You know, and if I was going to make something to be my definition of, of, existing it would be you know raising my children or, or being the best spouse you know that i can be um regardless of if i am at that point you know yeah i'm human i'm not the best spouse at all times i'm not the best father figure at all times but I'm, i do make a conscious effort you know to put my best foot forward and i think that if we continue to do that regardless of what we're doing on a daily basis to show up you know and i in a more figurative term showing up, I think, isn't just being present. So full engagement. Yeah. And bringing mm-hmm. it on every inspection, every interaction, every dinner, whatever it is, um, being present, being fully present every moment. Yeah. What, what challenges do you foresee this year for you and your business? Opportunities, uh, a lot of, a an lot abundance. of work. Yeah. An abundance yeah. of opportunity. Yeah, I, I don't see any problems because I feel like I'm very well set up at this point. Like I created this foundation, not to be very cliche with the whole <laughs> right. stuff, we created this foundation and I kind of start, started slowly mm-hmm. with the whole COVID thing and by not having social media. And then I just kind of built this, this thing where I, I was grabbing one agent at a time, you know, to now where I have 10 or 15 that use me pretty consistently but I haven't tried to reach out to grab any more yet. So mm-hmm. I, maybe another, the biggest opportunity this year is when these two guys do get done with their schooling and they're ready is providing, you know, opportunity for them and, and growth with off duty pro to make it, you know, something bigger than it is right now. Yeah. So what would that entail? A little, a few more agent I visits. I enjoy doing. Yeah. Yeah, it would just being able to put some FaceTime out there mm-hmm. because in central Texas, there are several of us that do this quite a few, honestly. And just to get people to say, Hey, so I don't want somebody to mess up my deal. I don't know you. I've never worked with you. Uh, how do I know, especially in this market that you're not going to tell my customer something or portray a deficiency in such a way that they're going to be like, no, I don't want that house, you know? And this is the 11th offer that I've written for this person this week. Uh, so now you brought them to this house and you turn, you know, uh, a molehill into a mountain. So I think it's super important to be able to communicate with them like, hey, this stuff is major. These are real safety factors. And this stuff is actually not that big of a deal. So if you're a DIY type of person, you can handle doing this stuff on your own. But I think ultimately, and it kind of brings me back to, to the software again, is that repair request builder. I've had agents accidentally text me the link that I've sent them uh, of the repair request builder (laughs) for the first time that they used it because they were trying to share it with another realtor friend. Like, oh my God. So this just saved me so much time. That's so cool. Yeah, I had one the other day. She said, oh my God, I didn't mean to send it to you. I apologize. (laughs) And my reply was, well, hopefully it was to an agent that I haven't used yet. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know, just so I have somebody else. There, there are so many different softwares out there to do this. You know, as I went through a hit and they had their own software and I tried my best. Uh, and they're, you know, as you well know, there's a ton of different softwares out there and some of them are great for certain individuals, but I have other firemen friends of mine that also are home inspectors with other people that have just been so bought into these other softwares that they can't switch. But when I tell them that I do my inspection, you know, my three hour inspection, I'm done. I do. That is incredible because I have to go home and I'm still, you know, sifting through this word-based report narrative (laughs) and I'm 
for another two hours. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Because I'm actually headed to baseball practice for my kids right now. Yeah, sucks for your kids. Games. Sucks for your wife. Yeah, sucks for everybody. Yeah, yeah. This isn't this isn't a time where you know I have to you know write stuff down on a piece of paper and then transfer the information later. Truly and honestly, I use the dictation uh, feature a lot. I have to be real careful and go back to make sure that that it's uh, edited appropriately. But yeah, I use that feature a lot. I tried to on the roof today, but it was like 15 mile an hour winds and it, it didn't work out for me real well. So I was having to type when I was on the roof, but I use it on my phone. I tried it with an iPad uh, and I like the fact that I can just throw my phone in my pocket. I can take all the pictures. Uh, and as long as AT&T has good service there, I can save and sync that report, you know, in less than five minutes. Beautiful. You know, with some of these, and it's seamless. And I can't be more appreciative. And I, and I try to make sure that if I put something out there on social media, that I show my gratitude towards the Spector and I try and link it. Uh, and I, I do have your team members that do comment on it and because uh, they see it too, you know, and, and I hope that it is. I hope that other inspectors that do follow me, because I have several from other states that follow my LinkedIn account as well. So hopefully that's bringing you business as well. Oh, yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah, it, if it helps you, helps us, then we all win at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, there's enough out there for mantra. everybody. Yeah. What a, I got one last question for you. I want to be respectful of your time here coming up on an hour. Um, what advice would you give kind of, you know, someone in your shoes, not necessarily a firefighter, but like there's a lot of part-time scale into the business type inspectors, right? And I think it's, there's so mm -hmm. many facets of it. So like wherever you want to take this, feel free, but what are some points of advice or things that you did well or could have done better that you'd tell them? So there's always stuff that I can do better. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think I feel that on a daily basis. Now I, I could have handled that differently. I could have, you know, had a different discussion. There's a lot of negativity when, when, because I do read the stuff on, on the, uh, the forums of yeah. the part-timers that do this. Uh, truly, honestly, I don't feel like I'm a part-timer. I feel like I work two full-time jobs, right. You know, and I, and I do, I put in a lot of effort to both of, to both of my professions to make sure that I'm, you know, doing the best that I can. But I think at the end, Kevin, it's what you and I have said right now, you have to just do it. If you want something and you want to try and, and do it, just take the step. That is the hardest thing to doing anything in my opinion. And now that I've been successful at starting something and it's working and we're having fun and, uh, you know, I'm able to provide value uh, to the community, to agents, to new home buyers, to somebody who's bought their fifth house or, or their 20th investment, I'm able to add value. Uh, and that's a good feeling. So my advice to anybody would take the step if it's something that you truly want to do, have a passion for it, uh, and just take it for what it is, you know, be able to, to roll with the punches because there's going to be a lot of them. There's ups and downs in everything that you try and do. So be able to... Love that. And you mentioned the forums. Every time the forum comes up, I always like to put out a, a PSA of be mindful of who you frequent online because some of the, you know, I'll just say how it is. Some of the old timers in the forums, I believe are just toxic. They're just completely negative. Oh God. <laughs> they shit, they shit on anything and everything kind of innovative or new. Um, I think every one of the 10 or 20, I don't even know how many are on there anymore. Basically told me Spectora would fail since day one. Um, a couple of them I'm proud to say are customers now, <laughs> uh, the irony. Um, but yeah, I think anyone in the business part-time or new needs to find their flock and, and find people like you, like connect with people, like reach out, go seek out those high functioning, high vibe individuals, because that mm -hmm. literally, that's going to elevate you um, or else you're, you're just going to be, you know, slouching around with the people that just want to be negative and see the bad and everything. Yeah, you know, and I try and surround myself with successful people. The, the one personality that really rubs me the wrong way is those people that that think too highly of themselves, that take themselves way too seriously. I, I can't, I can't handle it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't enjoy being around those people at all. That's, I try and see like the best in people. I try, but truly and honestly. But when when I get around people that are just so high and mighty it really <laughs> didn't bother me and i just kind of i kind of push that away and i just move move on to the next person that, exactly 
you know, I put on my psychology hat and I'm like, you know what, they're probably lacking in many ways and they don't feel comfortable with maybe what, with where they're at or what they accomplish. So then they project yeah. this, they peacock, as I call it of like, Oh yeah. Vectors are, are great at that certain ones. No, for sure. I actually did an inspection for a flip house of another inspector. Uh, that was, that was incredible. <laughs> that conversation was very uncomfortable. Uh, he actually looked me up and called me. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. He called me on the phone. He's like, oh, so I saw in my lock, my brother is a realtor and I saw in the lockbox uh, who you were. So I just wanted to call and communicate with you. I was like, well, first of all, it's super unethical uh, right. that, that, that we're having this conversation right now. Secondly, right. Uh, man, I appreciate it. I said, <laughs> but as you know, just as well as I do, that there's a, there's a lot of liability. And if I don't call things out uh, as the house tells me the story, then, you know, I'm putting myself at risk here. So I'm, I'm going to put, I'm going to write down every word that the house is telling me as I'm walking through. Uh, and it is what it is. I didn't build the house. I haven't lived in the house. I didn't make the renovations to the house that were totally wrong. Uh, so it is what it is. And I apologize if it, you know, if you feel like, you know, I shouldn't have written some of those things down, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. You mentioned something earlier. I forgot. I wanted to circle back to this. You possess, I think, I believe the make or break quality for people who succeed in this industry. And that is the way you mentioned earlier of agents asking you how you're going to communicate defects and put them into context. And I think that it's come up on the podcast a dozen times. And I think inspectors have to wrap their heads around the art of doing that while being ethical. I think to me, that's everything, especially in these markets. There's so many markets mm -hmm. across the country that are like this, maybe not as crazy as Austin, but you have to think about your language. And I think that's a very hard thing for inspectors to understand. Yeah. And I think that, you know, communication is, is a huge thing. I know that, you know, as a, as a husband, as a parent, I'm sure that there are ways that I could be a better communicator. Uh, but if you're mindful, at least of the things that you're saying and the way that you're saying them, especially to the client, but you're open and you're saying, hey, so these are things that, that are wrong with the home. I'm not a negotiator. So that's, that's the realtors you know, side of it, obviously. Right. Excuse me. Uh, but, you know, it is my obligation to at least tell them, hey, so this is, this is a story that we're being told. Uh, and this could be something you know uh, an HVAC system that's an R22 you know that was put in 2002 you know that's something that you're gonna have to budget for uh, and I know that's an eight thousand dollar thing is not a, it's not very comfortable especially for you know a 25 year old couple that's a new home buyer that just you know maybe took a portion of their retirement out to get the sixty thousand dollars they needed to put down on a home you know right, right. now that another eight thousand dollars uh but just know, hey, there's other ways around these things that are broken. Right. You know, there's solutions. There's solutions. Absolutely. And not everything is detrimental, man. I love it. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you for, for making the time and hanging in there today while I sorted out my internet issues. So I, um, <laughs> the same this, issue. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this has been nice fantastic. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to want to keep up with your progress. So we'll, we'll be staying in closer touch. But um, but thanks for joining, man. We really appreciate it. Good deal. It. I appreciate you. Have a great day. All right. Take care. See you. See you.